LEDs are extremely versatile, making them the go-to light source when retrofitting existing lamps and luminaires. However, dimming them requires careful coordination of lamps, drivers, and controls to ensure proper performance. Welcome to solving LED dimming issues in retrofit, retrofit projects. I'm your MC, Anthony Kapkin, editor of Electrical Business Magazine. We have registrants from British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and even Virginia. So clearly this subject resonates everywhere. Your presenter today is Forrest Kelsey, an expert with 28 years of experience in the automation, control, and instrumentation industry. He holds a master's in electrical engineering and is currently director of technical services at Legrand, serving as a technical mentor for the company's architectural dimming solution. Now, during the presentation, feel free to type in any questions in your questions panel, uh, and uh, provided there's time at the end of the presentation, we'll get to your questions, but Forrest will also provide some contact information. You can reach out to him directly. Now, be sure to visit ebmag.com slash webinars for all of our upcoming training sessions, and don't forget to participate in our new Canadian Electrical Awards launching May 1st. For information on all these things, visit ebmag.com. And with that, I'll hand it over to Forrest Kelsey. Forrest. Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining me today. I'm honored to present on the topic of solving LED dimming issues and retrofit projects. Uh, today, I'm looking to address issues that uh, relate to a number of options that you might have in an LED lighting project uh, for an existing building. Uh, with considerations that you might apply, uh, for example, you, you might be replacing fixtures or you may be simply looking to relamp uh, conventional fixtures with LED lamps. You may be trying to match existing dimmers or you may be looking to install new dimmers or dimming systems. Um, you may be looking for uh, replacing an older dimmer or a new one. Um, anyway, uh, there's a lot of different variables here, We're hoping to be able to cover much of that. Um, another one is that you may or may not be uh, willing and able to uh, run new wires. Um, and uh, while the scope of this discussion is targeted to retrofit, I should mention that a lot of it does indeed also carry over to uh, new construction. So I think, uh, as was mentioned, I think we're all in agreement that there are many advantages converting uh, conventional lighting to LED. Um, with the high efficacy of LEDs, we save considerably on energy and reduce power bills. Uh, with the extended lifespan of LEDs, we will at a very quick time uh, amortize against the cost of lamps alone, um, but also we'll save the labor cost and frustration of having to replace those lamps. Uh, together, reducing the power bill and uh, saving on replacement lamps makes a payback a, a, a very short uh, in a very short time frame, a very easy investment decision to make. Uh, so if we're going to go to LEDs, should we dim them? And obviously the answer is yes. Dimming does save uh, additional energy. Uh, we use it for uh, things such as daylight harvesting where we want to reduce uh, the light um, levels when natural lighting is, is present so that we can save energy. And that really is not acceptable to do with bi-level to the users of that space, even though that's something we see done sometimes. Uh, dimming really is the way to go with that. And uh, of course, there are many spaces where um, we actually want to change the lighting. We don't want them on full bright, not just for energy savings, but for appropriate lighting for the activity or time of day or whatever. But the reason for this webinar is that when we do look at dimming LEDs, we are introducing some complications. So let's, let's get into those. Uh, let's start by breaking down the makeup of an LED light fixture or LED replacement lamp. The circuitry that actually emits the light is the LED array module. Uh, this is a low voltage DC circuit that incorporates the LEDs themselves together with typically passive circuit components such as resistors. Uh, the LED driver is a second component, and this is an electronic circuit that converts the AC mains voltage to a compatible DC low voltage signal that feeds the LED module. Uh, when the dimmer sends a dimming signal to the LED fixture or the lamp, the key to successful dimming is the ability of that driver to deal with the signal and as a result uh, reduce the current that's fed 
to the LED module, regulating it appropriately so the level output's reduced without fluctuation. So the LED driver engineer is a, is a key, and honestly, some are, are better engineered than others. Getting better all the time. So let me make a, uh, a, a comparison. When we examine the LED driver, uh, let's compare this to the transformer. So for years, we've had low-voltage transformers uh, for things such as uh, MR16s. Um, while a transformer only reduces AC line voltage to uh, AC low voltage, 12 or, 12 or 24 volts typically, the driver does the same plus it converts to the DC uh, required by the LED array. It provides the regulation required and uh, it has to intelligently adapt this regulation uh, to the non-sinusoidal AC input that the that the dimmer is going to feed it, and we'll explain that further and illustrate that in a minute. I make this comparison to emphasize that uh, the trend in transformer technology over the years has shifted from inductive or magnetic to electronic, which are capacitive in nature, and this has, for the same reasons of efficiency and cost, continued through to the LED driver, that same trend of going to electronic. So I'd say that well over 99% of uh, line voltage drivers are capacitive in nature. The only magnetic drivers I've seen are typically feeding uh, LED strip lighting, and they're indeed an outlier. Um, we'll address the combination of a driver and a line voltage transformer later on in the presentation. Uh, so right now we're really just talking about uh, um, where we don't have a, another transformer in the, in the, when we're feeding a, a, a line voltage. Uh, driver. Um, now when we think of dimmers, there's, uh, we're typically talking about your, your, uh, your wall box dimmer. There are other ways of, uh, of doing dimming. Uh, dimmers may also be panelized instead of in a, in a wall box. And a lot of times we take a look at uh, there being other ways of dimming besides what we're going to describe right now. But I'm going to just talk for the moment about what we'll call line voltage dimming phase modification dimming or phase gap dimming, three different ways of t talking about the same thing. Uh, later on, we'll address options of control signal dimming. Uh, there are two forms of line voltage dimmer. Uh, the first is forward phase, and there are some other names that you might find in product literature, um, include leading edge dimmer, standard dimmer, magnetic dimmer, triac dimmer. Uh, this type of uh, dimmer is best for uh, magnetic or uh, inductive loads. Uh, then there's the second kind is the reverse phase dimmer that uh, were created for capacitive loads and other names that you might find uh, for this are uh, trailing edge, uh, ELV, or electronic uh, dimmer. Now let's uh, illustrate this concept with this diagram uh, showing how a phase cut or a phase modification dimmer works. So to the left, we're representing the AC line feed uh, fe voltage fed to the dimmer. Uh, this forward phase, the forward phase dimmer, excuse me, at the top takes a sinusoidal signal and modifies it uh, by doing the following. At the beginning of the positive going half cycle, at the zero cross, the output's opened up, and that remains open for a delay that's calculated to achieve the desired dimming level. So no, no voltage is going through to the load at this point. And then at the, the point that is desired, the circuit's closed, the voltage feeds from there on to the uh, lighting load for the remainder of the half cycle. Then this is repeated in the negative half cycle, and this cutting the voltage reduces the energy delivered reducing with the intent of reducing the light output. So this is going to occur twice a cycle, so 100 or 120 times per second, depending on the line frequency. Uh, this consistent cutting of power at this frequency isn't visible to the naked eye, so we observe nothing more than a reduction in light output. That's the intent. Uh, so if we tell the dimmer to reduce the light output further, it's going to uh, make the delay longer. If we tell it to brighten, it's going to reduce the delay uh, in order to deliver more power. Uh, so the type of dimmer that uh, typically uses uh, a, a triac, uh, sorry, this type of dimmer is the one that typically uses a triac as the gateway that is used to switch the power on and off to 120 times a second. Now the lower dimmer, the reverse phase dimmer, takes the same input voltage 
essentially does the same thing, but instead of opening at the beginning at the zero cross, it actually closes at the zero cross, leaves it closed, opens up after time, again calculated and achieved the desired dimming level. Uh, the reason for this type of dimming is that capacitive loads don't like that sudden voltage turn on of the forward phase dimmer. So this was designed for capacitive loads. And the switching mechanism that's typically used for this would either be an IGBT or a FET, different device than the, than the one used for forward phase. And now there are, there are dimmers that are capable of doing both, of uh, dual phase operation, and they can operate uh, either way. Some require a manual selection of the phase, while others will try to determine the appropriate phase to use automatically. And these, uh, the latter is known, are known as adaptive phase dimmers, and uh, they're, they typically, they'll use different algorithms. Uh, one of them that's typical is that they will determine whether the load is capacitive or inductive by whether the current leads or lags the voltage. Uh, some will look for current inrush spikes and change phase when they detect those. Um, now some of the dimmers, uh, such dimmers will allow for you to either do auto or manual selection. I think this is the best option. They allow you to uh, determine for yourself um, or allow it to determine for you if you don't know. If it doesn't seem to be working right in auto, you can switch it over and make it work in manual. Um, I do want you to be aware that many times uh, this type of dimmer, dimmer uh, regardless of uh, the switching options, is known as a universal dimmer, but you will see sometimes the word universal used for a dimmer that really isn't uh, reversible. Um, by re universal, they're simply referring to a forward phase dimmer that uh, is universal in load types. So it'll work for incandescent, it'll work for uh, dimmable fluorescent, it'll work for LED. So anytime you see the word universal, just check to verify that it is indeed um, reversible and not just forward phase. Um, so all this discussion that we've had to this point is leading to this uh, statement that we, the, the manufacturer of that LED driver has a dilemma. This is the dilemma. The, the driver is capacitive, so ideally they would engineer it for reverse phase dimmers, but they also know that the vast majority of installed dimmers are forward phase, and typically even if new dimmers are going to be installed, uh, forward phase are less expensive and more likely to be selected, uh, a lot of times they'll have higher power ratings. So uh, forgive the pun, but they're driven to make the capacitive loads work with a forward phase dimmer, and that's what they will engineer it to do. Uh, if a lamp is marked dimming or dimmable without any reference to the dimmer technology, it's, it's a pretty safe bet that it's intended uh, for use with a forward phase dimmer, may or may not be uh, with a reverse phase. Um, but there are complications and difficulties that arise for the dimmer manufacturer based on this trend of uh, drivers being designed for forward phase uh, when in, by nature they should be uh, working with a reverse phase. Um, and so uh, although I mentioned it is a, the, or here it is the dimmer manufacturer's preference the capacitive LED load be dimmed by an LV, ELV dimmer, I find that in many times the dimming performance, uh, which are factors we'll, we'll consider shorter, are actually better against a, a four phase dimmer, which speaks again to the amount of adjustments made by the driver manufacturer to the dimmer they anticipate that's going to be used most likely with their, with their um, lighting load. So, so don't take this last bullet point as a hard line stance. In fact, we find that some few uh, capacitive LED loads uh, will dim poorly in reverse phase. Now, just because we've determined correctly that an LED lamp or fixture is designed and designated as compatible with a particular dimming technology isn't going to guarantee that it will work with every dimmer of that technology. Uh, it might be tested with one dimmer and work well, but then not work well with another dimmer. Uh, a couple of reasons for this include variances uh, that you can find from one dimmer to another, even with the same supposed technology. For example, the switching circuit components ratings differ and that matters. The triac using one forward phase dimmer might be 5 amp maximum rating while another has a 20 amp. And the higher the, the maximum uh, rating, the higher the minimum current rating based on minimum current conduction issues that have to be met in order for that dimmer to work properly. Um, and in reverse phase dimmers, we've got multiple types of switching components, IGBTs and FETs, and they all have different operational characteristics. 
Uh, in addition to the switching components, whether it's the, the triac or other, um, there are other components uh, that dimmer from one, excuse me, that differ from one dimmer to another. Uh, for example, some uh, have snubber circuits that are designed to protect against voltage kickback while others do not, and their compatibility with one load may be different than uh, the other dimmer that doesn't have it. And uh, the algorithm that's used to actually perform the phase cut uh, may also vary from one to another and work better with some and not as well with others. So kind of think of this as a dating game. Don't just assume that just because you got a forward phase dimmer and a forward phase compatible load that they're going to work together. We want to get them dating and, and check this out first. So we'll always test first. Now, um, after speaking of, uh, of that, I do want to kind of talk about the issues that we see when we're doing uh, compatibility tests. And I'm going to kind of categorize them in three categories. So the first one I'm calling synchronization issues. Uh, these manifest themselves in a variety of ways. Essentially, we're, we're, we're talking about behavior that cannot be corrected and is unacceptable. Um, either the dimmer acts incorrectly or the fixture acts incorrectly. Uh, in such cases, there's nothing that can be done. We just have to declare these in, as incompatible. So some of the examples here are flicker um, that does, you know, is throughout the entire range or maybe through a certain range, uh, audible hum and buzz and that sort of thing. Um, now, another category is um, something that can be corrected. Um, if we see at the low end of the dimming curve some unacceptable uh, behavior, um, we can typically get rid of this issue by, uh, if the dimmer has a variable low end trim, trimming it up far enough that uh, you know, a pop-on or a pop-off or flicker at the low end can disappear. Um, and then we can have a dimmer that works with that uh, and that works fine, uh, although we do need to be aware that doing so may sacrifice the dimming floor or how close that light can actually go to, to dark, to zero. Um, but you know, typically we just have to live with what results after having uh, trimmed it out to eliminate the problems that we see at the low end. This is one of the more common things that we'll see um, with uh, compatibility issues, but again, correctable with a uh, low end trim. Uh, the third category um, is the minimum load requirement that uh, most dimmers are going to have. Uh, you, can, you can see those values typically on their cut sheets. Um, so for example, a load that's comprised of five lamps might work great with a dimmer, while if you took another load that was comprised of one of the same lamp, uh, it may not meet the minimum load. And the symptoms you may see uh, might be similar to what we've already been mentioned, uh, may simply not dim, or we might see uh, dimming um, uh, with flicker and that sort of thing. And we overcome these typically two ways. Number one, it's just like um, uh, we may take a look and say, well, um, if we do have loads that are less than the minimum load, we may want to take a look at a different uh, combination a different uh, lighting option. Um, the other one, if we're, if we're stuck with that or really think we want to go forward with that, is uh, overcoming it with adding in parallel uh, synthetic load, which is essentially a resistor uh, parallel to LED. Now, obviously, it's going to draw more current, compromising our energy efficiency, but typically it's still going to be considerably better than uh, the, the incandescent that we replaced. Um, so that's an option that we have. Now, um, after speaking of compatibility, I do want to mention that uh, just because a, um, a lamp is considered to be and tested and considered to be compatible with a particular dimmer doesn't necessarily speak to the dimming performance. Um, and some manufacturers, including Legrand that I work for, uh, do address some of the performance considerations in the compatibility test reports. So some of the things that you might see are, for example, we have an expectation, you know, based off of our incandescent paradigm, if we see incandescent lights dimming, uh, we can see um, the, uh, the coordinated color temperature warming in an incandescent lamp as it's dimmed. It gets dimmed, it gets more yellow as it's lowered, and it gets more blue as it's raised. Uh, another performance issue that we see, I mentioned before, was uh, a zero dimming floor is something that we anticipate with incandescent lights and rarely achieve with LED. We typically are going to get down to a certain floor and say, I can't dim beyond that. 
Um, and the other issue that we uh, typically look at in terms of performance is uh, linearity. So in, in other words, if I say, hey, I want this to look to go to 50% and I program to go to 50%, I want it to look like 50%. Um, and also, this this speaks to um, if I'm doing a fade rate, I want to have a, a, a constant fade rate. Now, um, performance against so those are the expectations, but uh, performance against those expectations will vary. Um, I do want to mention that uh, if that CCT warming is something that you're interested in, you may be aware that there are LED products out there that are you know dim to warm is is a typical um, nomenclature that we will see indicating that they have designed them to where as they dim, they will get more yellow. Also, um, in the specification for a dimmable LED, you will see typically a 1% or a 10% dimming floor. Um, now, I want you to be aware that that is a, a measured light output. So what we're saying is we take a, a measurement of the 100%, um, and then we take a measurement of the lowest end that we can get, and we do a division, and uh, it's 1% uh, or it's 10%. Um, but because the way the eye perceives light, it doesn't match to a sensor. In the North America, the typical relationship that we agree upon is a square root relationship. So if you take a 1%, take the square root of that, you got 10%. So a 1% rated LED will actually look like a 10% to the human eye. And a 10% is going to be about a 32%, so about a third of the level of the maximum on. Um, so that's one of the issues to be aware of. Currently, you'll see a lot of dim to dark uh, specifications that will exceed or go below the 1%. And there is a reason, as you can see, to go below the 1% because 1% really is only a 10% visual. Um, now, another thing that we can do is uh, is trim. I've already mentioned the low end trim. Low end tr trim is typically used just to avoid those issues that we see at the low end but it compromises, raises typically the dimming floor. However, in most cases, we've seen in our tests that uh, after doing that trim to eliminate the issues, we still can achieve the dimming floor that's specified by the manufacturer, in most cases, uh, from my experience. Now, the high-end trim is uh, not in every dimmer, but some dimmers have it. And here's an example. I'm showing uh, a curve. Uh, the blue, this is a dimming curve. Uh, so the blue line, the straight line, is our ideal. So 100% down to, to 0% uh, is what we would anticipate and hope for, but we'd never achieve that. Uh, I've got here three dimmers of my manufacturer of, of my company that were tested. Um, two of these, the, the one represented by the green and one represented by the red, have the high-end trim. The one that is the light blue does not have a high-end trim. That's what I wanted to show you to show by comparison. So the, uh, the red one is a forward phase. I mentioned before that a lot of times we see better performance uh, with a forward phase than we do with a reverse phase, even with a capacitive um, uh, lighting load. And in this case, we have that as an example. So this is after having done the calculation. No, excuse me, this is before. So this is measured light output. I, I take that back. Yes, this is after making the calculation. So uh, with the red one, we get down to 10%. And so with the both of the forward phase, the red and the light blue, we get down to 10% at the low end. And with the reverse phase, the green one, we only get down to 40%. So that's one thing to take a look at. But the other thing I wanted to illustrate, again, talking about the high-end trim, is if you take a look at that light blue one without high-end trim, I take that trimmer, excuse me, the dimmer, trim it down, or move it down all the way to 70%, it's still full bright. And at that point, it begins to dim from that, from 70 going down. So it's not linear at all. So what we do with the high-end trim is basically we trim that down so we never are going to 100%, kind of take a look at that knee as our new high-end point, and we take that and map that up to be the 100%. That's what we've done with the red line. So you can see now it doesn't have that high-end flat uh, portion of the line. So that's the reason for high-end trim. Again, it's not a compatibility, but a performance issue that that it addresses. Now, if you, this is another thing you need to be aware of with dimmers, that if you, uh, if you load an LED with, excuse me, a dimmer with LED load to the, to the dimmer's rated amperage, you're going to severely shorten the life of the dimmer. So, uh, you know, I mentioned in an earlier slide that the ideal situation for a capacitive load would be 
uh, dimming and reverse phase. So here with these two numbers, I want to illustrate um, that the heating impact on a reverse phase dimmer isn't nearly as severe as the heating impact on a forward phase dimmer. Now the duration for loads shown here are from my company. They may vary from one manufacturer to another, but you will likely see uh, similar duration. So you can see here I'm saying a, take a 16 amp dimmer that's forward phase, I'm going to apply a 0.2 multiplier saying you can now only put 3.2 amps of LED as opposed to 16 amps if it were incandescent. Uh, take a different dimmer that is reverse phase, it's rated for 10 amps. I have less of a restriction on the multiplier to 0.6 instead of a 0.2, resulting in 6 amps. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to illustrate that reverse phase dimming uh, typically doesn't have the same kind of duration requirements that a forward phase does. Now the good news when you take a look at this, don't be alarmed, uh, particularly in retrofit situations, is that because, you know, for example, a 60 watt incandescent lamp replaced by a 10 watt lamp, uh, LED, um, the dimmer that is designated to handle the original incandescent load can still handle the replacement LED uh, load. So just because we're talking 3.2 versus 16, if it's the same originally uh, incandescent and we didn't exceed that rating, we're likely not going to exceed the LED rating. Uh, these restrictions mostly come into play when we're redesigning new dimming zones. So if in your retrofit situation you are rezoning, uh, it's important to be aware of this. Now the following images are going to illustrate the waveforms uh, when we dim LEDs compared to incandescent. I'm going to start out with showing uh, incandescent, uh, um, L excuse me, incandescent load. So on the top left, what I'm showing is before I start dimming, this is just a straight uh, voltage fed to an incandescent light. The yellow curve. Uh, represents the voltage and the blue curve represents the current. That's the case in all of these of these images. Um, to the right, we're showing um, the on the top what happens when I do forward phase. So this is the output of a forward phase dimmer. You can see that the uh, current follows the voltage. It has a, a pattern that is similar uh, to the voltage sign. And then also if we take a look at the bottom, that's the reverse phase. So you can see in both cases, uh, the, and, and in all cases, dimmed and non-dimmed, uh, we have the current following the voltage when we're talking incandescent. Now the bottom left one, I'm just showing here without any dimming, this is, uh, this is just uh, an LED that is uh, not dimmed, showing what the current looks like on that. Now this is just one example. I'm going to show you some more examples uh, at random. Um, well, kind of random, uh, some other examples, to, uh, samples of LEDs. So here's the first one. Um, and you can see here that compared to what we just saw, uh, taking a look at the left, even before I start dimming, I've got a different current waveform. Uh, it looks fairly sinusoidal, but it's flattened at the top and the bottom. Um, and then when we take a look at what happens when we dim it, Notice that um, at, at the top right, when we are dimming uh, forward phase, notice that there is a current spike that occurs every half cycle, every time we turn on the voltage. But if we take a look at the bottom, which is reverse phase, uh, and compare the two, we notice it's a smoother transition. We don't have that spike. And this is the ma major reason why the derating factor is so much more significant for a forward phase dimmer than it is for reverse phase when it comes to dimming capacitive LEDs. Uh, you might notice the noise on the uh, current transformer wave, sorry, the current waveform uh, appear to be higher than what you saw in the incandescent example. And I'm going to point out that uh, because the current through the LED load is considerably lower than the current through the incandescent load, this, the scaling's turned up on this, on the oscilloscope. So the noise is more visible here. But with that being said, I do want to point out that there is more high frequency noise on the current waveform, whether it's dimmed or in, uh, whether undimmed or uh, dimmed in either direction. And this is the secondary factor in uh, dimmer loading duration, so that applies and that tells you why then we have a 0.6 multiplier even for a capacitive load on a, on a reverse fed dimmer. Here's the second randomly selected LED. Uh, you'll notice looking at the um, 
um, at the undimmed waveform that there's a lot of noise here, but it's pretty sinusoidal. Um, and if we take a look at the forward phase dimming, uh, we notice that not only do we have a spike at the voltage turn on, but we have a spike that continues through the positive half of the waveform following the voltage turn on. And then the negative half of the waveform just does the spike at the voltage turn on, similar to the first sample. Uh, both of those will disappear in a reverse phase application at the bottom. So this speaks to the fact that, you know, we don't know in advance what we're going to get when we, uh, when we uh, apply dimming to an LED load. Um, now this third one, I'm, this is the one that really I didn't uh, select at random. I selected this one in particular because this one I knew to be capacitive in nature, but that it doesn't dim well in reverse phase. So the manufacturer went so far making it compatible with forward phase that they didn't even think about making that reverse phase and or, and or fail to do so. So you can see that there's some stepping going on, a uh, result of something that they're doing uh, in the driver um, and then uh, in the undimmed signal as you, as you take a look at that current waveform. Um, then when we uh, go forward phase, we do see the spikes. It is dimming. The spikes are there, as you would expect. Um, when we attempt to dim in uh, reverse phase, uh, the waveform looks like something I haven't seen before. Not sure what it is, but I can tell you that uh, it's not dimming. Um, when it does dim at all, it, it flickers very severely. So, well, I give these three examples again uh, to illustrate that LED dimming is still the wild, wild west. You know, how a driver reacts to the same dimmer varies from one to another, and this is why manufacturers of lamps and manufacturers of dimmers. Uh, typically offer uh, testing services to verify compatibility and, again, as I mentioned, performance. Now, I've been talking about uh, line voltage uh, fixtures or lamps. There's an added com complication uh, when we start talking about low voltage lamps, such as MR16 fed by a transformer. Uh, transformers um, and compatible dimmers are designed for resistive load. But remember, uh, LED MR16s are capacitive, so there's some issues there. Toroidal magnetic transformers usually deal better with that, um, and they're easier to work with than electronic transformers that are designed for incandescent or halogen lamps. Um, ELV transformers uh, designed for halogen lamps add a, a, a la another level of complication in that they typically will have a minimum load rating that often is not met by a replacement LED lamp. Um, and a lot of times those transformers have two minimum uh, level uh, requirements. One is for non-dimming and even a lower one when you dim. So a replacement lamp that may meet the non-dim minimum load still doesn't meet the the, the uh, minimum load for dimming and therefore will not dim reliably. So bottom line is if you're intending to send an MR16 to a dimmer manufacturer for compatibility testing, you need to send the transformer as well. And now if your transformer is magnetic, maybe the, tra the, the manufacturer will ask for it or they'll just want to know the, the, the uh, transforms load rating. Now, I wanted to illustrate uh, a little bit of this complexity by showing something from a, uh, um, a GE LED, um, um, GD as a manufacturer of LEDs, showing uh, a, a document that they've put out on transformer compatibility for a particular line of MR16 uh, replacement lamps that they have. So you can see here there's uh, five different uh, models in this line. Uh, below it's, it's giving some a key that we'll use and we'll see in the next, in the next slide in the table. Green just means that it worked. Uh, they consider that compatible. Yellow means that there was a minimum load issue, meaning that with a single load slash transformer combination wasn't enough load. They had to add more in, a, in order to make it work. Uh, red means it just didn't work, so it's incompatible. White is it's not tested. Below that, the caveat that's typical of manufacturers, both LED light manufacturers as well as the dimmer manufacturers, basically stating, you know, there are conditions that are going to be on site that we can't reproduce in the laboratory. Uh, things change over time, um, and, you know, we can't guarantee that just because we've done a test here that it really will work. Now, that's, that's kind of the bad news. Uh, of all of this. So a lot of times we, we're going to recommend that even though it's tested by the manufacturer, you may want to try a sample um, in, on site before committing to um, the entirety of the project. Um, 
Now let's go on to that table. So here's the table uh, that I was talking about. The columns are voltage, brand, model, and power rating. And, and then to the right are the actual result um, columns, one column for each of the five models in the line. And um, so every one where it's green, you'll notice the word one. That's how many loads, it how many lo uh, excuse me, fixtures it took on that load to make it work. Wherever it's yellow, you'll notice a number that's higher than one. In all these cases, in particular, there were two. With two, they were able to make it percent sufficient minimum load in order to make it work in combination. And then where the reds are or where the test failed, I have to consider those incompatible. Again, the whites are where they just have not conducted a test. All right, so let me just mention, I, I mentioned early on that I would talk about alternative dimmers. Uh, we've been talking about line voltage dimming. Um, here's, here's some of the other kinds of dimming methods that you may see, and I'm going to group them together and call them all control signal dimming. What I mean by that is that by control signal dimming, we're going to feed a constant voltage, maybe switched, but it's never dimmed, uh, to the input of the dimmer, and then we're going to additionally feed it a signal that it will use to interpret the intended dimming level. So two categories of this are analog and digital. A couple of examples of analog. Most of you have heard of 0 to 10. Maybe some of you have seen or heard of PWM pulse width modulated. Pretty rare, but it does exist. Both of these are analog methods that are used. They're, they're uh, used to tell the driver what level to uh, dim the load to. Uh, digital, the two examples I think of are DMX and Dolly. Um, that are going to communicate over an addressed line to uh, the specific load that is addressed and tell it what load to go to, level to go to. Um, now, all of these control signal um, methods are, are going to require, in addition to the line voltage that feeds the, the fixture, they're going to require, require as well a pair of low voltage conductors to get the control signal line uh, to the fixture. And a lot of times we're going to think, well, the reason we did this is to give better performance. But I want to mention that they don't always perform better. Dolly, for example, is a European standard. And for whatever reason, they thought logarithmic dimming curve works well. A lot of us here in the United States say that doesn't look good. We get a very fast dimming rate at the top end and a very slow dimming rate at the bottom end. Um, and I have tested um, fixtures that are dual capable of 0 to 10 as well as ELV, and I have found better performance with the ELV in, in every case, uh, actual better dimming floor, which was the thing I would have expected the 0 to 10 would have done a, a better regulation on. But just don't expect or anticipate necessarily that you are going to get better performance by using this. Uh, so I'm going to kind of finalize with some recommendations uh, for succeeding when you're doing dimming um, of LEDs and, and changing out and or adding um, dimmers in a uh, situation. First off, I would uh, recommend that you learn the terminology that we've talked about, um, you know, forward phase, reverse phase, and the equivalent terminology for those, and review. Uh, for compatibility on each product's uh, specification sheet uh, to start out with, you know, what's the compatibility of this LED? What's, what is this uh, um, dimmer capable of? Let's make sure that we match that first. Uh, another thing is um, consider the performance expectations of the project. I mentioned before, do we need dim to warm? So we want to be looking for fixtures that are dim to warm, excuse me, warm to dim compatible, capable. Uh, what is the dimming floor requirement for this? For example, if it's an office space, dimming floor really is not a big deal. I'm dimming down a little bit. I'm saving energy, uh, but I don't want that to go really, really dark. But if I'm on a boardroom or a classroom and I want to do a presentation, I want a lower dimming floor. If I'm in a restaurant, I want a very, very low dimming floor uh, for the ambiance requirement. Uh, linearity is another thing, may not matter in the office space, but is going to matter more in areas where we're setting scenes. This lamp is, or this load is bright, this one's dim so that we achieve the, the uh, focus on particular elements in the space and or achieve uh, whatever it is of the activity that we're trying to do. Um, and then the final recommendation for success is always uh, test samples of uh, proposed LEDs uh, with the uh, proposed uh, dimmer before we commit 
I have manufacturer help with that and do some on-site before doing the full lamp replacement. So that concludes the presentation. Open for questions. Ah, excellent. Thank you very much, Forrest. And uh, again, as Forrest just mentioned, uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so just feel free, uh, if any come in, just type them into your questions panel and uh, we'll forward those on to Forrest. He can address them right away. Uh, now, meantime, barring any other questions, uh, you do have uh, Forrest's email there showing on the screen. You could always contact him offline for a little more guidance, a little more information. Uh, but Forrest, I would like to ask you, uh, just because uh, you did use the words, uh, you know, LED dimming is a, a little bit like the Wild West. Uh, so perhaps you could, uh, in, in a simplified way, sort of step by step, explain how one would go about, uh, let's say if I were a facility manager and I'm looking at a retrofit project for one of my commercial office spaces, how do I even embark upon research? Uh, who do I go see first? Uh, do, do I see a lighting designer? Do I see my electrical distributor? Um, how do I start getting that information? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say in the first place, you're probably going to want to investigate your options for the um, lighting control system that you're, or the candidates for lighting control systems that you are considering. Um, that's where it starts for me because the features you're looking for, uh, the um, you know the capabilities. That's that's where it all begins. I say that from a company that does lighting control uh, systems. Um, and so once you've kind of come up with the candidates for that, then you take a look at their options. You know, what, what kind of dimming options do they have? Most good ones are going to have capabilities of 0 to 10, forward phase, reverse phase, uh, digital if you want, and all that. Um, and, you, and it's nice to be able to find a manufacturer that has the ability to take all the different fixtures of your choice once you get to that point, which is the next step, and um, get the... Uh, be able to incorporate all that together for uh, with you know good uh, so a good system. So that's step one from my in, in my mind. Um, and a lot of times doing that, you know, a lighting uh, designer and or a distributor, whichever one you're comfortable with, is a good place to start. Uh, if you go with a distributor, a lot of times that distributor also is going to have uh, LEDs. Um, hopefully they've had their LED pa their LEDs tested with the manufacturers that they sell, and that's kind of a good way to go a lot of times is to go with a distributor then that can package the whole thing, kind of leave the responsibility to them to make sure that they're helping out with with compatibility. I, I, I don't put all the responsibility on them, of course, as I mentioned, I think <laughs> there's still that requirement at the beginning in my mind, you know, let's get a few of these and let's try this, uh, make sure that we don't have issues on site. And I, I, I should mention at this point, you know, noise issues on site, can be amplified through a dimmer and maybe not detected so much in incandescent lighting, but more so in LED. So, you know, doing a few samples on site is always a good idea just to make sure that we're not uh, seeing some issues um, that they can't reproduce in the laboratory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, very good, very good advice. Uh, another question has come in from Robert um, who asks, which dimming options may work best with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth controls? Well, that really is more on the control side of it. So as I mentioned uh, you know, in answer to your first question, if uh, you're looking first for a candidate control system and you come across a Wi-Fi system, for example, then you really want to take a look with that manufacturer and see what they offer, uh, which technologies, and, that, and they could. Uh, you know, regardless of the communication path, they could give you all of those options. So that's just a matter of investigation once you've selected, I want to go with this Wi-Fi, I want to go with this manufacturer, then you can see what options are they, but they, that they offer. But those are, as I'm trying to get at, those are really independent uh, of the actual communication and more dependent on the offering by that uh, systems uh, manufacturer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's a manufacturer uh, and, and yeah. platform specific, not necessarily just a general thing overall. Right. 
Okay, and uh, another question that Robert had asked is, uh, and I can't remember now, I'd, I'd have to go back, uh, whether this was covered earlier in the presentation, but uh, he asked, what is the exact definition of linearization curve when it comes to dimming? Okay, so the linearization curve that I showed um, is representing, again, using the square root law that we, uh, relationship that we um, we use in the United States or we pretty much agreed upon. Um, it shows um, when you take a look at the actual, uh, w w okay, let me, let me explain this again. So we're going to take a measurement of multiple points of dimming. So if I program it to 100%, program it to 70 to 50, all the way down, I'm going to take measurements, I'm going to apply that square root calculation and draw that out to compare it against that straight line that I'm hoping for. Again, two reasons for this. You know, lighting designer says, hey, I want this to 50%. I turn it to 50% and the lighting designer says, that looks like 70% to me. If he's got the calibrated eye, right? Um, and the other thing is, as I mentioned before, if I don't have a linear curve uh, and I do a fade from on to off or a ramp from off to on, and it starts out fast and goes slow, or vice versa, then a lot of times that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for a constant fade rate. Does that answer the question? Yeah, we'll wait to see if uh, Robert uh, questions or, or answers back to see oh. if that uh, covers it or not. Um, okay. now, now, I have one question, and, and this one might be just a whole other subject of a, a series of webinars, so, so feel free to stop me if this is just too huge to even answer. But Let's say uh, I've already gone through my retrofit project. Perhaps I haven't done all the homework that I should have done, and now I'm experiencing dimming issues. Perhaps some of the ones that you mentioned early on in the presentation, uh, you know, the flicker, low end. Um, what do you think should be my first uh, point of attack, if you will, when it comes, comes to the troubleshooting? Well, um, so whoever is responsible for the installation of that, and typically the manufacturer of uh, the system, the dimmers, is going to either, this is from my experience, I'm speaking from my paradigm, um, they're going to either have their own startup people and or they're going to hire that out to certified uh, third party or representatives. Um, and so typically these would be people that would be trained to deal with uh, those kinds of issues, and they do arise, you know, um, even though, like I said, a lot of times we'll have lamps sent in for, for dimming, they get them on the site, don't work as, as well as anticipated, so it's a matter of doing some diagnostic work at that point, determining the nature of it, um, and um, a lot of times, most of the time, the issue is uh, inacceptable behavior at the low end, of the dimming curve and a raising of the dimming floor with a trim uh, is something that can be fixed. Sometimes we see um, samples that were sent to us did not present issues of minimum loading, seemed to present sufficient load for the dimmer to operate correctly, but the, what was installed in the field must have some kind of a variance, and uh, so minimum load uh, isn't met and adding a synthetic load is a lot of times an option for that. Um, depending on where you get your lamps, and this is something, you know, we tell a lot of people that ask, you know, where to get lamps. I mentioned before, you know, if you've got a distributor who also reps the dimmer, a lot of times you can get some help from them as well. Um, if you're not doing that, you know, if you're buying from a distributor separately, the LED from the the, the dimmer manufacturer, I, I have to say, from my perspective, most of the times the correction is not on the dimmer side, it's on the LED side is where um, correction can be made. Um, and that may be, like I said, if you've already invested for the whole system, you may be, you may be looking at uh, an expensive change, change out. We don't want to do that. So that's the reason why I, I, I mentioned, you know, try to do some sample testing before you you uh, you uh, do the whole system. Whole uh, very good, good advice, good advice. Uh, incidentally, before I forget, uh, Robert did uh, text back to say uh, thank you very much. So I guess you got that uh, linearization uh, answer okay in in Robert's books. Um, and it also sounds to me uh, just with the uh, the possible finickiness 
uh, with these kinds of technologies, it uh, it probably makes sense to uh, you know work with someone, deal with people you know you trust, you know people. Yeah. Uh, to my thinking, you know, sounds like they're in it for the long haul, and they actually know something about the te technology. You've you've heard about them before, and you see them on the right. streets. Right. Oh, excellent. And in that in that sense. Um, you know, brand name uh, lamps are a better choice than, you know, non-branded Chinese manufactured um, products that we see a lot of people try it because they're less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Well, excellent. With that, uh, we're sort of out of racetrack here. So thanks again, Forrest, uh, for, for delivering this presentation. And again, we're going to have this uh, up on our YouTube channel shortly so that you can refer back to it. Uh, sorry, not you, Forrest, but uh, our attendees. <laughs> and uh, they can refer back to it. And uh, to all of you who have attended, uh, thanks for taking the time to do so. Hopefully you have some, some information, some guidance that you can implement right away. Uh, meantime, again, visit evmag.com. Stay tuned for other training opportunities. And uh, have a safe and productive afternoon. Thanks, everyone.